Eric Murphy and Jamie Boone, everybody. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Atheist Experience. <laughs> I'm Russell Glasser, and this is my co-host, Tracy Harris. Howdy. <laughs> we are broadcasting live from the American Atheist Convention 2018. Everybody having a good time? <laughs> You know, Eric came to the atheist community uh, like over a year ago, and one day I found out he's just like, I, I just discovered he was out in the audience and I'm in the middle of prepping for a show like I do every week, and then suddenly I hear everybody cheering and applauding, which is not normal, and I find out Eric has appointed himself our hype man and getting the audience excited beforehand. <laughs> And I think the rest of us kind of roll our eyes at that, that stuff, especially Tracy. <laughs> Actually, I had the opportunity to be in the audience, mm -hmm. I think last week, and that was when I got to experience Eric firsthand. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Up close. It's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun to have him out there doing that. Yeah, it's, um, it's still a little strange. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but it's pretty cool to have, uh, to have hype people and uh, an entire crew here, which is, uh, which is awesome. And I want to thank all the people who uh, donated to help us get everybody out here. And I can't believe that they managed to pull together. We are live streaming, right? Yeah. Yes. Hi, That's people. <laughs> Uh, as Eric said, I've been involved with the Atheist Experience a long time. I uh, was elected president of the Atheist Community of Austin almost three years ago, which means I get to take credit for lots of the incredible things that all these other people do. <laughs> uh, we now run four different shows, I believe. So we got the Atheist Experience, the nonprofits, Talk Heathen, and now uh, the rebooted Godless Bitches. Preaching, preaching humanist is another one that... Uh, yeah. Okay, so five. And so people come to Austin and they come to our studio and they're like, I thought it would be bigger. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we, we get guests through every week. Um, and the thing is that when we do regular shows with phone callers, which we don't have today, and by the way, you can still hand up note cards during the show. Yeah, please, questions, please. Yeah, because don't leave us hanging <laughs> This here. is not our normal format. Uh, by the way, Tracy and I are both used to sitting in the host spot, and so we've already recognized that we're yeah. probably going to be interrupting each other a lot. Battling for alpha status. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, and I'm going to lose that battle. Eventually. <laughs> um, uh, but... When we're taking calls, uh, we have very hard-working call screeners making sure that uh, uh, optimally we get no more than 50% atheist callers because we know you like the fun stuff when we <laughs> get in arguments with people. Um, but I, I did, so this is going to be a little different than we're used to, but I did uh, want to preemptively answer one of the questions that uh, I think we always get when we're uh, talking to other atheists, which is, do you guys have a very difficult question or topic uh, that comes up often? And my answer to that is not exactly. Um, we have things that come up over and over and over again, and some of them are hard questions, and if you guys have tried to argue with religious relatives, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, when you're an atheist, you're expected to be an expert on evolution and cosmology and ethics and law and just about every topic. But the same things do kind of come up over and over again, right? There's only so many times you can answer, aren't you scared of hell? And, and say, well, that's just Pascal's wager. Um, and not develop kind of a routine that you're going to wind up in. Uh, but the thing that really 
frustrates me the most is not a particular question, but a, an attitude or a point of view that I see coming up all the time, which is basically the idea that everybody seems to think now that they're an expert in stuff that they have no idea about. <laughs> Anybody else run into that problem? <laughs> um, a couple of months ago, I was attending a lecture by uh, an old uh, high school friend of mine who is now a physicist at CERN. Uh, and he, and he, uh, so Daniel Whiteson and his co-author Jorge Cham, who is a cartoonist, have written a cartoon book called We Have No Idea, which is about uh, our understanding of, uh, of physics and the things that we don't know yet about the universe, such as, and this is something he spent a lot of time on in his lecture, the fact that we only know a very small portion of what makes up the universe, and because there is this stuff that they broadly refer to as dark matter, one of the things we have no idea about really is whether the universe is going to collapse into a big crunch or keep expanding forever and die of heat death, or something else. We got a lot of speculation, but really, we have no idea, which again is the title of the book that I'm helping them plug for free. Um, <laughs> a few days later, I was hosting the show, and a theist called in and, and said, OK, I'm building my argument on God now. OK, so physicists all know that the universe is going to die of heat death. <laughs> Um, and I told him, I'd just been listening to a professional physics, physicist with a PhD and everything tell me, we don't know that. And he kept insisting over and over again, no, 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 we know that. All physicists think that. You should really read more. <laughs> um, the challenge of being a public speaker, I think, is that you have to acknowledge that you don't know everything. And especially when it comes to the skepticism community, which is awesome and I love everybody, uh, but even a lot of creationists and a lot of climate change deniers and those kind of people will self-appoint the label, uh, I'm, I'm just skeptical, when what they really mean is, I've come to a conclusion about how things are, uh, I've watched some hour-long YouTube videos, and I know all about it, and I reject everything that you're going to say, and I'll just say, where's the evidence every time you say anything and not listen to what the actual evidence is. Uh, I don't want to feel like I'm monologuing this no, whole no, time. No, no, it's fine. Do you want to pitch you have in? a topic. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because we talked a little bit about this earlier, and I actually have a different, I mean, I agree with you, we were on the same page, I'm not like throwing you a curve here, but I have a different thought, which is um, whenever we get the calls where someone wants to argue about a particular topic of science, it's almost like this idea that, well, let me, let me get into something that most people don't study, most people don't know about, and then you will have weak footing because you're not an expert on this, and so I will come at you with a bunch of information that you really don't have the credentials to, to, to effectively challenge. Now, you can <laughs> challenge Chopra. it. Chopra. <laughs> you can... You can challenge it, but, uh, but since I don't have that information, and I'm an atheist, that information or the lack of that information is not what's informing my atheism. So we can talk about it if you want to talk about it, but I don't really know about it. It doesn't matter to me in, insofar as my atheism. But what's more important is experts in these fields don't seem to be informed about how this would affect religious beliefs. Right? So we don't see, when the person comes in and says, I'm going to call and I want to talk to you about physics because physics proves my God, I'm sitting there wondering, well, then how come all the physicists don't believe in your God? Right? I mean, this isn't, I don't even, to me, I feel like I don't even have to go there because all I have to say is, well, when you look at the experts in the field that you're claiming demonstrates your God, the people that have come up with the evidence, the people who have interpreted the evidence, the people who are writing all the papers and giving us all of this information don't agree with you. Yeah. So is, is it more likely that all of these experts don't understand the information that they've provided you and how to interpret it, or that you're the person who figured it out? Yeah. <laughs> you're spot on, and when we, 
when we talk about things like this, uh, people, because they know a number of the words in fallacies, say, oh, that's just an argument from authority. Um, but, but to me, I think a, an important part of being a skeptic is recognizing that uh, human understanding as a whole is very limited. And in particular, you, <laughs> uh, any given individual and also us too, there's a lot of stuff even within the realm of human, uh, human knowledge and understanding that we don't understand because we have not spent the 10,000 hours that it takes to achieve basic mastery of any subject. And by the way, that's a statistic I've heard from like cracked.com, so take that <laughs> with a pound of salt. Um, but <clears throat> Uh, Eric mentioned I have uh, two degrees in computery stuff, uh, and so if I am an expert in anything, it's like writing software. Uh, and even then, there are there are specializations in writing software that uh, uh, that different people focus on. Uh, but one of the things that I'm interested in in general is. As a person who talks to a lot of people on the phone all the time about their beliefs, and also as a person who has, I guess, a pretty solid understanding of technology and the internet and communication, uh, what's been on my mind a lot in the last few years is how people take in and process information. And the way that a few years ago I would have said that, that the internet is an amazing thing for human knowledge because you can just put out anything there and everybody can, agree, uh, can, can find out about uh, these facts that they wouldn't otherwise have had easy access to. But another thing that I've noticed is that because information is so easy to get, and also because there are so many communities that split off and make their own versions of what they think is true, people will watch a one hour YouTube video and say, all right, I know everything about the subject. Ask me a question. Right. I think I talked to you a little bit about, you know, it's interesting, my degree is in is liberal science and it's um, it was a requirement that I, break off three areas of specialization, none of which could be shared in the same college. So they wanted to make sure that you did pursue areas of knowledge that were not interrelated so that you didn't just go for something easy, like low hanging, I'm really good at this and I'll just go for three things within this particular college and that'll be my degree. They were like, no, you have to really branch out. And one of the areas that I chose was anthropology. And so I have probably sufficient credits to what would be equate to like a minor. And then I have other areas of specialization that feed into that as well. And that comes together to form the overall degree, which is the concept of the Renaissance person. And so every now and then, somebody will say, I took this class, Anthropology of Religion, and now I have this theory about you know, how religion evolved and how it's affected the whole world and what causes religion. And I'm sitting here thinking, there are people who study nothing but anthropology of religion, who have degrees that specialize in anthropology of religion. I've taken far more anthropology classes. I would not presume to even step into what you just claimed to have come up with. And I don't even, I, I know I don't know what they know, but I totally know what you don't know. <laughs> it's, it's as if when you don't know something about a subject, you know that you don't know anything. And then when you learn a little about the subject, you think you know everything suddenly. Yeah. And then you learn more about it, and then you're back to, actually, I know almost nothing. Yeah, about and this. I vacillate. I mean, I have this, in some ways, the, the topic of anthropology, the area of anthropology, can open people's minds because it gets you to challenge your cultural assumptions. There's a lot of things that people take as evolutionary realities about humanity that when you study other cultures, you begin to realize, oh no, wait, this is a cultural construct. This has nothing to do with reality. This is about, you can, this varies from culture to culture. I thought this was what humans do, but this is just what we do. 
And sometimes somebody would say, oh, and it was you know, an intercultural study because it included France, Germany, and the US. And when you're an anthropologist and you hear that, you just kind of chuckle, like, oh, that's cute. They think it's intercultural, right? They're all Western cultures. Yes, they have differences, but they're very, very homogenous compared to the diversity of culture that is out there that we do not ever hear about, do not ever know about. Most people in this room will probably live and die and not even ever know the extent of all the cultures that are out there that you could be looking at that we never even hear about, that we don't study. The word polyandry probably means nothing to a lot of, like, what is that? I've had people say, why is it that whenever we talk about, you know, uh, multiple partners in a marriage, it's always, you know, multiple wives. And I'm like, yeah, no, it's not. That's not correct. It's just that's all you hear about because we interact with the Middle East and we interact with cultures here in the West that have that sort of, you know, multiple wife model, but there are multiple husband models as well. We just don't study those cultures. They're not important to us because they don't have oil. And so <laughs> they don't exist in our experience for the most part. And so when you... When are, you are you maybe saying that when males come to a conclusion about something, <laughs> they don't consider other perspectives? That, no. That, <laughs> Wait, no. I'm saying, no? I'm, okay. I'm saying that... Because that I would totally support you if you said that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm just saying that there's, there's so much that we don't know. And, you know, now I don't even know what am I. What am I saying? <laughs> what was the, I, um, this is really, I went off well, on a tangent. Oh, no. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I think what we're both trying to say really is that uh, skepticism doesn't just mean, uh, <laughs> you can't just go into skepticism and be like, well, skepticism is logical, and I have applied this skepticism word to myself, and therefore, everything I think is right. Done. Um, all people, theists and atheists, need to approach subjects with a little bit of humility about uh, knowing that they haven't read all there is to read about anything, really, and that one of the skills you can pick up, whether it feels like an, uh, an argument from authority or not, is learning to recognize who are the people who have actually put in the work to know what they're talking about more than most people and use them as a proxy way of acquiring knowledge because there are all these little communities in the internet that you can get into that will mutually reinforce each other um, and, uh, and go on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever your preferred po uh, medium of choice is uh, and have people reinforce what you think. But actually learning about a subject in a way that's rigorous is Hard work, so. It is, and I wanna hit one more thing and then we could probably start looking at some of these questions. But yeah, we got questions. There's a couple ways that you can handle that. You know, when someone calls the show and they, like I had a caller, I, I, this is not common for the atheist experience, but we, we did get this weird rash of the flat earthers, right? So mm -hmm. talk heathens took them on, bless you. Those, uh, those are for, recent. For right? taking it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a recent nightmare. <laughs> and so I had this one caller that called in and wanted to talk about flat earth and so obviously I was sort of like, okay, I mean, I've seen the websites online and ha ha ha, but I really have this person on the phone now. And so they're on the phone and they're telling me they think the earth is flat. And I, I'm kind of flummoxed and I'm just, you know, so the first thing out of my mouth is something like, what about satellites, right? And they start to tell me the, the apologetic response to why satellites aren't, you know, you can't know satellites. And so then I was like, well, what about, you know, I start coming out, well, what about this and what about this? We did a couple of those, and then I thought, oh, wait a minute, this is, this is the rabbit hole. This is like arguing the Bible, right? This is the thing where I'm gonna, I could sit here all day long and say, what about? And they're just gonna tell me their weird thing. Now, when Talk Heathens got the call, it just so happened that they had a, an aerospace engineer, or, or like, it was like, you know, somebody who actually understood the, the whole science of, of you know, the, the universe and the world that we know about. And that person took this caller on. And my understanding is that it was pretty amazing to have that conversation with that particular guest just happening to be on when this person called them. But when he called me, he didn't have, I didn't have that background, obviously. 
And so I did a few of these things and I thought, whoa, you know, I am, I am not equipped to have a conversation on proving to a person that doesn't believe the world is round that it's round. I mean, I can talk about things all day long, but he's got his website talking points and I don't really, you know, the full science behind it. I mean, I'm, I understand the, he the basic stuff. He gives a shit stuff. about this topic more than you. Yeah, like I have not spent my time trying to figure out why, why we believe the earth is round. I've seen sufficient evidence to convince me that, of that and he's saying he doesn't accept any of this evidence and I'm just like, okay, I don't know what to do with this person. After about the third, what about this? I thought this is, this is a rabbit hole, this is not gonna work. And so I said, okay, how about this? The earth is flat, why God? And so he starts to argue about the earth being flat. And I said, no, 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 the earth is flat. Like I'm giving you that, the earth is flat, why God? So then he starts to talk about, well, we're in the middle of the universe. Like apparently, I guess we're in the center of the universe based on this model. And so I just said, okay, what difference does it make where you're located in the universe? If we're like, I don't know, if there's like a left edge and we're a foot away from that, like what is, how does, why God? Well, because we're in the center of the universe. Yeah, okay, so what does the positioning matter here? Like how is, why God? And so there's a few different ways you can deal with stuff. You know, if you're an aerospace engineer or astrophysicist, you can take it on and you can argue it all day long if you want to, or you can start pulling up websites and trying to inform yourself sufficiently with astrophysics information to combat this person, or you can just say, yeah, okay, I don't agree with you that the Earth is flat, but let's just for the sake of argument say it's flat, why God? It sort of pulled the legs out. Yeah, the, the what's your point question in general <laughs> is a good one to try to get to uh, because they can come at you all day with, uh, uh, with pat answers that they have, but if they can't make that logical conclusion in, uh, <laughs> in their own way without relying on reciting stuff that they read online. Well, I'm pretty sure that this person was probably used to just sort of going into his flat earth apologetics, which, you know, and, and confronting people who have not studied the science thoroughly behind why we know the earth is, is round. Mm -hmm. And he's just used to probably diving into that argument and spending hours like just driving people in circles with that, with that concept. Until they throw their drink in their face and, and, yeah. and go away. But I'm just like, why are we arguing this? Like, what does this have to do with anything? And I was just informed that it was an aerospace student named EJ that was the guest on oh, oh, uh, yes. talking. And so EJ, who's also the president student. of the, uh, the Austin Secular Student Alliance, yeah. which is also an amazing organization. Do we got questions? We do have questions. Do we have a Camille in Florida? What? Oh, no. We'll get... We're putting her back on hold. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, we need names on these, or, or we can't call people up. ID. But well, we can just. Who help. asked? How can you feel so? How can you stay so patient? Like five people, right? Oh. <laughs> uh, anyone ask that question? How can you stay so patient when faced with? Well, I, I was asked it like a few times already today, and okay. I just want to say that when you have a camera in front of you, it's really easy to maintain your composure. So imagine your life where you want to just throttle like, yeah. somebody that you know and you know that this is on video and that it's going to be posted for posterity and it will live like that meme that was mentioned earlier it will live forever and haunt you till you die and this so you you measure your reactions a little more i think when you're in front of a camera talking to strangers yeah um well, some of us moderate our responses when yelling or when, when taking questions. Uh, I wish some of those people ran the United States, but <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Is Camille still on the phone? We also have Haley. Okay. Hey, it's you. We have a live person. Oh, can I have my card before I go? Yeah. <laughs> what did I ask? Did you get a thing, Eric? Wait, where'd Eric go? Do we do things? Do we have things? Are they supposed to get things? I don't know. I don't, are we still doing the bling thing? Swag? Thank you. I've okay. actually been corrected on that. It was like, right. it's not bling, it's swag. 
go. So I'm super excited that Godless Bitches is back oh, because I was such a fan before and I just found out now that it is back. So I'm super excited. Yes, we're back. So along that same line, uh, how can we increase the number of women in the movement and kind of amplify their voices? I have an opinion about that, but I'm going to shut up. No, no, go. <laughs> By all means, go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't, don't leave me to answer this question, being a guy t explaining to If it starts guys to go bad, I'll kick you under the table. Here. I'll what? be like, no, no, stop, stop, stop. We'll, I'll take it. Uh, well, <laughs> you're really going to make me do this? Do you, if you're not, okay. not comfortable, I'll take it. I mean, no, I, I can I, start it, and then you, you can start. chime in. All right. So, you know, I... I just want to say, I don't know what it is about me, but I don't, I don't, I don't tend to experience a lot of the harassment that I know that a lot of other women in the movement experience. It may just be that I'm not as engaged with people directly. So there are some bloggers, for example, that are very engaged, you know, directly with their audience, and you can go to their blogs and see the horrendous commentary. So, I mean, there, there is no question but that this kind of ugliness occurs. Now... Part of the problem that happens, and, and I don't know that this is going to be so much a fix as just if people are more aware of this, maybe they can think about their behavior a little bit differently or things they say or things they think. I had a young woman that was in another area of the country and she wanted to know if there was a secular community she could go and talk to. She was living with her family. She was a young adult, but still lived at home, and her family was extremely, extremely conservative Christian, and she was not out. So it was kind of risky for her to kind of go out, but she had, because it's such a conservative Christian group that she was with, obviously they teach you that you are just like nothing. Women are, you're, you're nothing. You, you, you cause the fall of man. You are handed to your husband by your dad, and if something happens to you or you're sexually assaulted, then you're just kind of ruined because, you know, who wants damaged goods? And so this is, this is the attitude she's coming out of. And so she goes to this meetup, and she writes me back, and she says, hey, I went to the meetup at the local group that you identified, right? And this was not a group that I was familiar with. I just found them online, and I said, they seem to be near your area. And the first time she attended, she got her ass grabbed. Right? So this is a young woman who's already kind of nervous about going out and introducing herself to this new community. She's already used to be treated like chattel. And then she goes there and someone grabs her ass. And she did the right thing. She let the group know. She reported it to their leadership who said, it's okay because that member is gay, so don't take it seriously. I mean, you, you have to take it seriously. You can't not take it seriously because you have to look at a lot of the people within the atheist community are coming from religious backgrounds. And when you come out of a religious background, a lot of these young women are thinking to themselves, finally, finally, I get to interact with people who are not going to look at me like I'm less human, like I'm a thing, like I'm only as valuable as will I date them. Like, I'm going to show up at the meetup and six guys are going to be talking to me, but only because they're hoping they get my number at the end of the night. They have to be valued more than that. And it, like I said, it, I, I, from an individual standpoint, if I'm the person that's addressing this, like, I, I'm there and this young woman, she's attractive, she, she comes in, she's cute, she's very interested. She's an atheist. There aren't that many atheist cute women that come to our meetups. We never see them, so I'm so excited, right? And so I really want to talk to her, and I really want to get to know her, and you know, I'd love to meet an atheist girl that I can date. But I mean, you cannot put that kind of pressure on somebody right when they walk in the door. You really have to back off and say, let the, let the person come into the group. You know, the, they're not just there for dating fodder. Um. To me, as the president of, of an atheist community, and again, I'm going to give this disclaimer because people, uh, uh, people often, men will ask other men, why don't you have more women? Uh, and my first answer is always, uh, why don't you ask the women first? Um, the, a lot of atheist organizations pay lip service to uh, wanting more women in the movement, but then through their actions don't necessarily encourage people. So you've got 
first of all, the uphill problem that the atheist community is mostly men. Uh, and I experienced that kind of environment in two parts of my life because, again, I'm a software engineer, and that's a, a somewhat skewed uh, <laughs> demographic, uh, as well as also being an enthusiastic gamer and hearing actual active pushback all the time when women want to get involved with gaming or talk about gaming or just get on their microphones and the first thing some idiot says is, oh, make me a sandwich. Um, you have to take the concerns of women seriously uh, when, when they tell you what their concerns are. Uh, and you have to, <laughs> I mean, People act like it's some crystal ball that you need to have to know whether someone wants, uh, whether someone might want to date you or not. And what, am I never supposed to ask anyone out? But the answer is just, uh, if they say they don't want you to do something, then don't do it. Or if they look like they're afraid to say that they don't want to do something, then don't do it. Uh, and also take the voices of women seriously uh, with respect to the things that they have to say uh, because I've seen some studies going around that uh, pe even when the exact same claim comes out of a woman or, or a man, uh, people are more likely to assume the woman is lying. Uh, and there's all kinds of situations where a woman will speak up in uh, like a business meeting and say something and uh, all the men in the room will just glaze over and then a man will say, I think what she was trying to say is, and then everybody will say, yeah, man, good idea. Um, <laughs> don't just say you want more women in the community. Uh, be ready to welcome them and take them seriously and address the things that are, that are their problems. And if they say someone's harassing them, maybe uh, default to thinking, yeah, they're probably being harassed and don't like it. Yeah, it, it's kind of, you know, I'm so down with me too. <laughs> and the, there's, um, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of stories, I guess, just, you know, listen to those stories and listen to those experiences and try to, you know, understand where people are coming from. It's, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, I think, is a very important exercise especially when we're dealing with somebody that might be in a minority community or even in the case of, of women, not really a minority, but treated like a minority community in a lot of ways. So for me, raising awareness around the experience of the other so that other people can kind of maybe get some insight into that because there's a little, I, I, saw, I saw this really interesting thing that was uh, posted online, it was an artist who said he heard a conversation between two uncles who were talking about the good old days, you know, when men were men and women were women. And um, he went and found these mainstream advertisements that were horrendously sexist with visuals. And he took those ads and then he redid them with models and had the men on, in the women's uh, position and the, the women in the men's position and put those ads online. And so I just thought that's kind of a funny thing and I clicked on it and I started to look at the images and I, it made me really uncomfortable. Like looking at those images, I had a weird reaction that I didn't expect. I felt uncomfortable by looking at them. Part of what made me uncomfortable was seeing the, the woman in the image behaving toward the men in this way that I found reprehensible. And so I felt like I don't want to be that character. I, it was, and from the time I was younger, I'd always looked at those ads and thought to myself, um, it sucks to be the person in the ad who's being stepped on. But then when I looked at it from the other way, I thought, it's scary to be the person in the ad that's doing the stepping. Like, that frightens me. And... I kind of thought to myself for the first time, instead of what is it like for women, what is it like for me to grow up, what has that done to me to grow up in a world where I'm looked at like these advertisements that you know, were in vogue when my parents were you know, alive and kicking. And for the first time I thought, what is it like to grow up in a world where you're portrayed like that man? What is it like to grow up in a world where you're constantly portrayed as this domineering thing? 
that dominates and subjugates this, these other things. What does that do to your head, right? That would mess up my head I, in a different way. But in some ways, instead of look, thinking about how do I get past that role of subjugation that I've been subjected to all this time, I had to think, how would I get past that role of subjugating? And so I think it's pretty fair to at least come to the table, and, and I'm not saying that this is on women because I don't believe that it is, but I'm saying that for the first time I thought to myself, maybe an understanding that this person is dealing with a lifetime of being taught to subjugate can help me think of ways to communicate what I've gone through and what it's like to be the person subjugated because it's not something they're going to easily understand. Uh, have we got Camille here? What well, else the question? Let's the look question at it. The question that Camille in Florida asked, well, it's not a question, but it okay. was, I was just watching the news and someone said, Trump is God's response to Christians' prayers. <laughs> Let's all let that sink in for a second. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, wow. So one of the things is that we... Uh, we at least say we try to avoid being overtly political on the atheist experience, but it has gotten very hard not to be political as an atheist lately, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and one of the problems actually comes back to the main thing that I was talking about at the beginning, which is people believing that they are experts on things that they actually know nothing about. I believe I heard some public figure say once, I know more about, know more about war than the generals, believe me. <laughs> and this um, healthcare thing, got it, right? Got it. <laughs> yeah, who knew it would be hard? Nailed it. <laughs> um, and I know, like statistically, there are probably at least a few Trump fans in the audience, <laughs> like maybe one or two right now. Uh, Go ahead, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Identify yourself. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, the thing is that we've, uh, on the atheist experience, spent so many years arguing that a reality-based point of view is important and you can't just make up your own facts uh, and you need to understand the limits of your knowledge uh, and you should look to people who know what they're talking about if you want to get a real understanding of the mainstream view of a subject. It's a little frustrating to have someone show up who just... Uh, lies without shame all the time directly to the camera and, and uh, doesn't seem to experience any consequences for it. Boy, am I getting political. <laughs> um, but, but that is an issue we care about. And at the same time, it feels weird that evangelicals have embraced uh, this guy seemingly more than anyone else who has, uh, who has run for anything in years and years and years. When he was running, I even remember some prominent voices uh, in the atheist community saying, well, the silver lining is maybe he's an atheist because he doesn't really talk about God. And to me, what Donald Trump believes deep down inside doesn't matter to me that much Evangelicals really like him because he goes after them. He says and does things that they want him to say and do. And the fact that he has a bunch of marriages and a history of cheating and some gross comments in public doesn't seem to affect them as much, which I think says a lot about evangelicalism yeah. anyway. Yeah, it's not just, yeah, it's not just, uh, I mean, I've seen them before saying, well, these, these accusations are in the past, and I'm like, yeah, but he's lying about them right now, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> I, it was so bizarre to me to see a person caught on tape bragging about sexual assault, 
and then see women come forward and say, yes, I was one of the women that was sexually assaulted, and have him say, oh, he's lying women. <laughs> and then have evangelicals say, we believe him. Yeah. It's like, wait, <laughs> he admitted to doing this. There was a study I pulled up when Roy Moore was running, and he was uh, accused of molesting a whole bunch of underage girls. Uh, that there was a small, like a minority, but a significant demographic who said, now that I've heard this, I want to vote for Roy Moore even more. That blows my mind. Yeah, I can't for explain real. it. I can't explain. I mean, it's... It kind of, yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that they, uh, that they believe the accusations, but also there were some articles that came out that there's this whole evangelical subculture where it's normal and expected that very young girls will be groomed as wives for like 30 and 40 year olds. Uh, I'm against that. <laughs> <laughs> Bold stance, I know, <laughs> American atheist. Uh, Kelly, is there a Kelly here? Somebody say something? I think there's someone coming up. Okay. What? This was EJ. I think there's a sticker over there, though. Oh, oh, okay. Right. Want to come I, grab these? What about, do we do that for the person that just said? No. There you go. Anyway, just start throwing stickers. I'm so excited that you guys are here, because I know I'll never make it to Austin, ever. But, um, Don't say never. Well, hopefully one day, I don't know. But when I grew up, I grew up Mormon, very indoctrinated, very, um, a lot of the cultures like you described earlier, a lot of uh, toxic perfectionism and all this stuff. So as like you were a fundamentalist at one point, right? Right. So how did you get over like some of your irrational fears that, that may have lingered? Like I, even though I've been an atheist for a long time, sometimes one or two might pop up, and I know it's You're talking about like fear, like fear of hell, or? Not hell, I actually like, hearing Matt Dillahunty speak about hell, I think helped a lot. Other things so like. So what, what um, kind of fears are you talking about? <laughs> this is really embarrassing. Huh? You're among oh, friends. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, like sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, <Aww. laughs> Um, Like, I live alone, so if I hear like a bump in a night, you know, like my first thing is, I hope it's not a ghost, and I know oh, it's not. Okay. I know it's not. <laughs> Funny story is I was talking to somebody who was laughing about people believing in ghosts, and then I found out they believed in demons. <laughs> they, they, they thought it was ridiculous that someone would believe ghosts were responsible for certain things, but it's okay to think that demons were responsible for those things. But uh, as far as a rash, I, I don't know that that was about, like, tied to my religious deconversion. I think that was tied to when I, once I got a mortgage, <laughs> Ghosts just didn't see, you know, it was like, bring on the demon, because <laughs> this thing is the, is the biggest thing I fear right now, is this, this mortgage. Um, I think, for me, taking responsibility for my life, it, that's a huge thing, too, right? So the empowerment, the empowerment that you get when you step away from religion, because you don't, somebody mentioned earlier about not having that safety net, and... I think that when you become responsible for your life and everything that happens in your life, when you, when you don't just sit down and pray about it, when you actually have to do things, when stuff won't get done if you don't do it, when you have to pay that electric bill where the lights don't come on, um, when you become responsible for your... For me, it, it meant trying to empower myself in as many areas of my life as possible so that I could then control as much as I could. It's not like I think I can control everything. I understand there are aspects of existence that are beyond uh, one individual's capacity to control. But at the same time, knowing that, why would I want to give up or relinquish control of things if I could control them? It's like knowing that I can't control it 100%, but if I can control it 80%, wouldn't I want that control? Right? Don't I want to run my life as much as I can? And you know, things are going to happen to people that uh, take it away from them. Not everybody has the same capacity for control of, of their life, even if they're you know, still a human being. And so for me, when I started to understand that I was the person who was ultimately responsible for everything in my life, literally the supernatural, weird little childlike fears that I had 
dissipated. I mean, it, it, all I had to think about was, man, I have all this responsibility. I have this work that I have to do. I have this project that's, you know, is in jeopardy, and I have to get this done. Um, I didn't really, and what's really funny is when I was little, my parents had no filter as far, I was allowed to watch horror movies, like really graphic horror films, The Exorcist, when I was like single digit old. And part of it was my, I had a five year older sibling and my argument, which I guess to my parents was really compelling was how come they get to watch it? You know, well, because they're older and they don't freak out at night and not sleep and come running into our room to sleep because they're terrified of the exorcist. So it's not a good idea to necessarily let every kid watch everything they want to see, even if they make a big fuss and if there's the, the parental, you know, guidance that I'm offering. But at the same time, now, I can't consume enough horror. Like, I watch horror movies all the time, and I'm just like, oh, that's not even scary. Like, give me something scary. And I, I sometimes complain and say, nothing scares me anymore, right? I, I can't even get scared. I can't even find that scary thing. Uh, so when I do stumble across one that's still a little frightening or unnerving, I'm like, ooh, that's pretty good. That was a, that was good written, well-written plot, good direction. What? Uh, OK. What, let's see. What I think about the question, uh, and I'm a bad person to ask because I was raised by atheist parents, so I don't have those same superstitions about hell or or supernatural stuff that a lot of people do, although all kids <laughs> think things are out to get them. And uh, uh, so we have that shared experience. But what I think is really important in general in dealing with fears and anxieties, mostly uh, is to seek out uh, conversation and sympathy from other people. Uh, and I think that's true no matter what kind of anxieties you're having, which is why I'm so stoked that all these people from all over the place are converging on Oklahoma because a lot of atheists don't get to spend time with other atheists regularly. Yeah. <laughs> and just feel free to speak their mind without uh, being afraid uh, that other people will think they're crazy. And, and talking through the things that are bothering you is so important to everyone. Uh, my son, Ben, who's been going to Camp Quest in Texas for many years, uh, I used to always ask him, uh, you know, so did they push skepticism on you? Did they have classes <laughs> in atheism? And he would say, no, but it was the great, a great experience because when I uh, go to school, I have to moderate what I say all the time because uh, most people believe in God and, and I might lose friends, but at Camp Quest, I can just say those things and, uh, and people will be sympathetic to me. And I think we all underestimate how important community is to everybody, including atheists. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Few of these have names remaining, uh, so the question is, uh, wait a minute, as a physician, should I discuss religion during a patient visit? Is that a Who's joke? A physician? <laughs> Are there any, is there a doctor in the house? Yeah, I would say no, I would say definitely not. <laughs> three minutes? I thought we had eight. <laughs> well, three, three minutes is reliably when in the show we expect somebody to call in with a giant philosophical <laughs> question. <laughs> right. Uh, so I don't, I, I don't know if this qualifies. Uh, you really need to be careful talking about religion if you're an atheist uh, for professional reasons and also for reasons like, I don't know, if you're a physician, you're not a therapist. Um, but also, if someone asks you directly, it's hard to just uh, lie or put them off without feeling intellectually dishonest. And as I always say, with a couple of minutes left to go in the show, I don't know, we should talk more about that question. In I think time. that if a patient <laughs> has questions about religion, it's fair to ask them about their religious affiliation and maybe suggest that they visit the mosque or the... Uh, church or the whatever temple. of their temple of their choice. Thank you. I was like, you're yes. the, you're the Jewish guy. Tell me what that is. Um, and yeah, 
and let that person sort of deal with that. You know, I, had, I did a whole show with uh, Rod Poole, who was a psychiatrist mm -hmm. who was involved in uh, prayer and therapy debate with the Royal College of Psychiatrists in uh, the UK. And he called in and talked about this. He handles ethics questions for that group as well. And one of the things he was saying is that, you know, this is what religious leaders are for, to deal with our patients' religious needs. If they have need religious support, I send them there. I am not, you know, my, my psychiatric degree does not qualify me to be a religious sounding yeah. part. Yeah, and I think in closing, obviously we're not fans of religion. And we don't think uh, that religion provides a lot of insightful or good answers. But we also know uh, that if there's anything religion does a good job at, and even that is sometimes dicey, but it's having other people to, uh, it's providing an environment where other people can spend time with you. And that in itself is a good thing to have, and it's something that the atheists, that atheists should be ready to provide more of. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you talk to people who don't agree with you, you don't have to be convinced what the, by what they're saying to at least make an effort to listen to what they're actually saying and reach out to them and try to understand what they're thinking instead of assuming that you know everything because you watched a YouTube video about their beliefs. So I think that's our show. Yeah. <laughs> joining us after after the show at Star of India uh, if we can get there